Man, good morning, church. Uh, two Sundays ago, um, we talked about the uh, first fruit of discipleship, right? And uh, which is the uh, fruit of the Christian character that God wants in us. Now, I firmly believe that a uh, truly converted individual will have a, a total transformation um, of his character that is manifested by his actions and um, that is uh, totally pleasing to God. You know, his lips, his actions, and his heart are aligned uh, according to the righteousness of God. Now, as we go along, uh, and this morning, uh, please bear with me because we will study some grammar, uh, we will study some Greek words, and uh, throwing out uh, to you all, I don't want to pretend or even uh, sound like I'm an, uh, I'm an expert in grammar <laughs> or I'm an expert in Greek for I am not, no, not even close, but I'm trying my best, <laughs> trying to learn every day. No, but uh, just for this morning, just for this morning, um, let me be your grammar and let me be your Greek teacher. <laughs> so just pretend. Just pretend that uh, I know better than you do. Just this, uh, this time. Okay. So this morning, we will discuss the second fruit of discipleship, which is the uh, fruit of witnessing, soul winning. And uh, our topic for this morning is witnessing for Jesus. With uh, Paul's character of transformation, comes his ministry of witnessing. So we have seen the transformation of Paul, and we have seen how uh, he went out and uh, witnessed to people, and that was his uh, ministry. Now, after learning from other believers, after being converted, he went out witnessing for Jesus to win souls for Jesus' kingdom. Now, when we say the word witness, um, what comes to mind is that someone will tell the truth as you are called a witness. Okay? And in the legal parlance, uh, you can see in a courtroom scenario, a person would stand up on a witness stand and will raise his right hand and he will say, you know, uh, I swear the truth. No, and nothing but the truth, to so tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God, right? But if we will go deeper, if we will dig and go deeper underneath the word witness, we will learn there's something to it than just telling the truth. In the Greek word, martus, that's the Greek word for martyr. A witness, martyr, one who bears witness of the truth and suffers death in the cost of Christ. An example is in Acts chapter 22, verse 20. And when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was shed, I stood, I stood there giving my approval and watching over the garments of those who killed him. So this was Paul talking, referring that uh, uh, he was there when... Uh, Stephen uh, was killed. Now, upon reading this, we have now a clear view and a much more better understanding of the word witness. We are not just only to tell the truth, but we must also be ready. You must also be ready to suffer. And if that is necessary to die, for the cause of Jesus. So that is the whole meaning of the word witness, right? Now, in the word witness, we are not to cower when our life is threatened. You will go ahead, even if your life is depending on the line. And uh, we are not to compromise in exchange for material comfort. So being a witness, you are ready to put your line for
for the cost of Christ. So, witnessing is the process of preaching Jesus and his gospel in all truth, without any reservations, with an intent of winning them over to Christ. And that is what <clears throat> witnessing is all about. Now, the fruits <clears throat> that we bear are not only a change of our character, but also in the, it is a change of how we view ourselves in the light of the kingdom. Okay? Now, just like the early disciples, we also become a vessel, an instrument of Christ that must carry his name towards the ends of the earth. So that is our part of our Monday. Now, let us see the command of Jesus uh, before he ascended to heaven. Let us try to understand the real meaning of the Great Commission. And I know many of us here have memorized and have read the Great Commission, especially Matthew chapter 28, 19, and 20, over and over again. So we will try to, to dissect the real meaning behind Matthew chapter 28, 19, and 20 with regards to the Great Commission and with regards to, the, to our fruits of our discipleship, which is witnessing for Christ. Now, <clears throat> to fully understand the Great Commission, one would have to go to the original text, to the original text of the verse and uh, well first <clears throat> you can go to any website to any website for that matter to any uh, materials you know that translates the new testament in its original greek form now i go to biblehub.com i use that uh, website and it's so full of information so looking at the original uh, text of Matthew 28, verse 19, uh, 19 and 20. <clears throat> now, it looks like this from the original Greek text. It says, having gone, therefore, disciple all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I commanded you, and behold, I with you am all the days until the completion of the age. So that is the original Greek text translated into our English language. <clears throat> now, second, most people thought that the command of Jesus here is the word go, especially if, you're, if you will read our newer version of English translation. Okay. We have that thought that the command of Jesus is to go. And uh, I used to think that also. I used to think that the command of Jesus in this text is the word go. Okay. But with careful study of the text and the grammar that goes with it, there is actually only one imperative verb in this sentence, in this verse. And there are three what they call present participles in this particular text. Now, let me go to this first. The imperative verbs, they say, are used to give commands. Okay. Action words, verb. And the participles, or the present participles, tells you basically how to do it. And uh, they normally, as they say, end in ing. So, again, in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the imperative verb, if you're going to look at the original text, the imperative verb or the command in this commission is actually the word disciple. It is not the word go. Okay? That is the verb in its original text. So the, 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 the command is disciple. One word, disciple. Now, in... Uh, in grammar, disciple, it can be a noun or a verb. Okay? 
So it can be a noun or a verb. As a noun, it actually refers to a person. It is one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines of another. As a verb, it is an action word to train, to educate, to teach. That's why the verb in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission is disciple. It is an action to train, to educate, and to teach. As a noun, disciple refers to a person. As a verb, refers to an action to be done. Disciple as a noun, it is an outcome. Okay? The person, the end. But as a verb, it is a process. Discipling. Or normally they call it discipleship. All right? So there is actually a big difference between when you use the word disciple as a noun and when you use the word disciple as a verb. Now, Matthew 28, in its original context, doesn't say make disciple. It doesn't say make disciple. Because when you make disciple, the, the word disciple becomes a noun. And the verb is make. So make disciple. But in the original text, the disciple is the verb. All right? So are you following? Okay. Good. <laughs> so, now, if the command is to make or make disciple, you are now obligated to produce, to have an outcome, to have an end result, a disciple. Again, if the command is to make disciple or make disciple, you are commanded, you are obligated to produce a disciple, if that is the command. Now, for the sake of our learning this morning, let us presume <clears throat> that the command is make disciple. Okay? Let us assume the command is make disciple. If, for example, Brother Charles here has been a disciple of Jesus all his life, all his life, he has been a disciple of Jesus Christ, and up until now, never made a single disciple. He never made a single disciple. Now again, the command, for example, is make disciple. And he never make or made a single disciple, never produced a single disciple. Then he failed to do the command. Correct? He failed to do the command to make disciple because he never made any disciple in his lifetime. He failed. He falls short of the glory of God because the command is to make disciple. Okay? That's why, okay, that's why as a noun, it is an outcome. It is an outcome. When you make disciple, you have to produce. But as a command, oh, again, but that is not the command. Okay? The command is to disciple or disciple, which is a process. Now, on the other hand, the same example, on the other hand, the same example. Now, this time, the command is disciple. Okay? The command is disciple. Brother Charles, though he never made a single disciple in his lifetime, but he went out. He went out and he preached the gospel. He went out and disciple, meaning he witnessed to people. He shared the gospel about Jesus. He preached the gospel to many people. He witnessed to people about Jesus. The question now is, did he fail the command? The answer is no. He did not fail the command because the command is disciple. The command is to teach. The command is to witness. The command is to educate. Are you getting the difference? Are you getting the difference? All right. So he did not fail because he did what the command told him, tell him to do. And that is disciple evangelize okay 
Now, again, the command is disciple and it is not make disciple. That is why it is a process. It is a process that we do, discipling. Now, if we go now to, to Mark, the same commission in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, to, to have a better understanding of what we are discussing, this is what uh, the original text in Mark chapter 16 looks like in our English text. And he said to them, having gone into all, into the world all, proclaim the gospel to all the creation. Now, in this particular text, the imperative verb, the verb used is proclaim. The command is proclaim. Synonymous with the word preach. Synonymous with the word disciple. All right? So we have both the accounts of Matthew and the account of Mark agreeing with each other that the command is actually the process of discipling. Okay. So disciple, teaching, witnessing, bringing the truth. And now Mark, he said proclaim. It is bringing the gospel as the true word of God. So Mark and Matthew's account, they do not contradict each other because they have both in mind in mind to evangelize, to go out and preach the gospel. So again, the command is disciple. The command is proclaim. Therefore, the, our mandate is the process of bringing the gospel to people. We are to plant the seed, planting the seed, planting the word, preaching the word, planting that word of God in a person's heart. And it is up to that person to respond to the seed that you planted. And it is not up to us. It is up to that person if he will heed, if he will accept, if he will become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Our purpose, our job is to plant that seed. Our job is to evangelize, disciple, proclaim preach the gospel. Now, going back to Matthew 28. Now, the next part, what are the participles? Meaning, how are we to disciple? How are we to, to go out and proclaim? Now, the three participles here that tells us how is the word go or going, the word baptizing, the word teaching. That is the process how you would disciple. Now, let me go first to the word baptizing. Well, the concept about baptizing is to help that person understand the value, okay, the real meaning, the value of baptism with regards to salvation. So you have to, 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 to teach that. You have to educate people the value of salvation. And then baptizing a person affirms his faith in Jesus and conveys his lifelong commitment to serving Jesus Christ. And that is baptizing. Now, the next part is teaching. Now, teaching, I want to point out two things in the word teaching. Number one, what are we going to teach? Number one is teaching the things that you know about Jesus Christ that transform you into a disciple. Okay. Now the word all, the word all, okay, teaching them to observe all things. The word all means all that you know, all right? All that you know about Jesus that made you accept Jesus Christ. All that you know that made you a disciple, you have to teach that. Okay. What makes you a disciple, you have to teach that to the other person so that person can also be a disciple just like you. Now the second point with the word teaching, what are we going to teach? 
according to the, to the verse, is teach them to obey Jesus. Now, the best way for us to teach obedience is actually by being an example to them so that they can see in you a Christ-centered servant so that it will be easy for them to understand what you are trying to convey because they see in you the real truth of the things that you are teaching to them that you are applying it to your life. And that's how we should also teach. Okay? So two things in teaching, telling them the truth and embodying that truth in your life, the way you live. So it is our oral theology, you know, when you, when you say the word, when you teach the word orally, and it is our theology in action, the way we live, the way we align, again, the way we align our minds, our hearts, our lips to that of the righteousness of God. And that is the word teaching. Now, the third is the word go or going. Now, both Matthew and Mark use the word having gone. All right? So, having gone. Now, it means, it is synonymous with the, the phrase, so where you, wherever you go, or as you are going. So, the word having gone, that is the real meaning in our uh, layman's English. So, wherever you go, or as you are going. So, the idea here is not about going in other parts of the world to disciple. But if you can, if you can go out, if you can travel the world and disciple, you know, good. That's good. Now, nothing, of course, nothing, nothing prevents you from doing that. But the basic idea is as you are doing what the context is trying to tell us, having gone, is as you are going in your daily life. That is the meaning of the text. Wherever you go, or as you are going in your daily life, what you are already doing in your life on a daily basis. For example, if you are a student, if you are a student, as you go on your daily life as a student, Jesus said, disciple. If you are working, as you go in your daily life, working, or if you are an employee, or if you are the boss, or if you are the business owner, Jesus said, disciple. Disciple. We have to teach your colleagues, we have to teach your colleagues all you know about Jesus Christ and help them understand the role of faith and baptism so that they can be transformed and be a disciple like you. So when Matthew and Mark use the word having gone, they, it has the idea of wherever you go, disciple. Okay. As you are going, disciple. Now the question now is, what about the word all nations that we have seen a while ago? All nations that Jesus commands us to disciple. Okay. Having gone, therefore, disciple all the nations. Now, the word nations in Matthew chapter 28, the Greek word for that is ethnos, which means a race, people, or nation as distinct from Israel with reference to the Gentiles. So when Matthew wrote the Great Commission, he had in mind the Gentiles, okay? And it is also ethnicity. That's, why, that's where we get the word, the English term ethnicity from ethnos. And another term that's being used for nation or world is gay, the physical earth. But that is not what was used in Matthew. And another term used is cosmos, universe or the inhabitants. 
Now in Mark 16:15 the the word used in the Greek is cosmos pertaining to the inhabitants. Okay? Now with the context of Matthew and the context of Mark they use the word ethnos and cosmos as an inhabitants respectively. Now it made me think it made me think that why was there a change of Greek name or Greek word from ethnos to, to Matthew to cosmos in Mark? So why is it? Now, now the answer lies with the audience. Okay, the answer lies with, with the audience uh, these books were written to. Remember, uh, the book of Matthew it was written with in mind the the uh, the Jews, all right. The Jews as the audience of Matthew, the book of Matthew. So, at that time, during the time of of Jesus Christ, the only reference there are only two references for for uh, for uh, race or for people. We normally call them the Jews. It's either you're a Jews or you're what? A Gentiles. Right? So when Matthew, all right, so when 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 Matthew uses the word ethnos because his audience were or was the, the Jews, he used the word ethnos that pertains to the Gentiles. All right? So when Jesus commanded them to uh, when Jesus commanded him to disciple, Matthew had in mind to go to the lost sinners, which were the Gentiles. That's why he used the word ethnos, pertaining to the Gentiles, the unbelievers. All right. Now, in the book of Mark, he used the word cosmos, which is inhabitants, because the book of Mark, his audience was the Gentiles. So he used the word cosmos because if he used the word ethnos, it will be a derogatory remark. It will insult his audience, which is the Gentiles. So that's why he was careful in using uh, his words so not to offend the Gentiles. So that's why he said cosmos. You go to the inhabitants. You go to other people. He did not say, you go to the sinner, the Gentiles, because the Gentiles would be offended. So that's why there was a change of meaning or a change of term used between Matthew and Mark. All right. Now, with that said, I hope you, you, you're, you're following me. With that said, Jesus was telling his disciples to include the Gentiles and now in the book of Mark, to include the unbelieving inhabitants. Therefore, in general term, when Jesus commanded or given or gave, gave the great commission, it was for all unbelievers. Okay. Now, the word all, all nations, the word all means there are no longer restrictions. There are no longer exclusivity as to whom you and I should preach. That's why we say the gospel is for all. It includes anybody. So the context here of the command to disciple pertains to all unbelievers. Now again, if we can travel around the world, and do mission work, preaching and witnessing, uh, witnessing for Jesus, awesome. That's wonderful. But you don't have to go so far to disciple. Again, you don't have to go so far to disciple. The main idea is disciple, bring the gospel as you go in your daily life to those not like you. You being a disciple of Jesus. And that you can do 
with your neighbors, with your office mates, and wherever you are going, having gone, therefore. So both the context of Matthew and Mark agree with each other on the Great Commission. So now we understand our mandate to disciple and how to do it. Now, what is now the content of our witnessing or our preaching? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17, Yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. So the content, number one, of our witnessing or proclaiming or preaching is the good news. And what is the good news? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 and 4. It pertains to the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I receive, I pass on to you. As of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So we are to proclaim, we are to witness the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Jesus Christ. We must witness, we must say that Jesus Christ resurrected. He was resurrected. Because there are those who claim that there is no resurrection of the dead. Now, second, what must be the content of our witnessing? In Luke chapter 24, verses 46 to 48, and he told them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and his name, and in his name, repentance and forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So part of our witnessing is we must proclaim repentance and forgiveness, which is equivalent to the salvation. And we must, we must proclaim that. We must preach that as the content, part of the content of our witnessing. The third, we must, we, we must witness that Jesus is Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, you see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. Never Preach yourself when you go out. Never preach yourself when you go out. Never glorify or magnify yourself when you preach the gospel. Always preach about Jesus. Let Jesus take all the glory. Let Jesus take all the credit. Paul said, we don't go around preaching ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord. The fourth is we preach, we witness the excellencies of God. According to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of the one having called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, what does this mean? To proclaim his excellencies. It is the attribute of God. It is the goodness of God to you. Now, let's go, read in verse, uh, let's go and read verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you receive mercy. That is part of the excellencies of God. Before, you are nothing. 
Before you were a sinner, you were a slave. But now, according to 1 Peter, you are now the people of God. If you go back again to 1 Peter 2.9, you are now a chosen people. But before you were nothing. You are nobody. But now you are a chosen race. A royal priesthood. And then he goes on to say, once you had not received mercy, but now you have mercy. In Ephesians chapter 2, remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope. Without hope. Can you imagine yourself Without Jesus Christ, you have no hope whatsoever. And it goes on to say, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You see, those are the excellencies of God. Now, we are to witness to people, my dear brethren and friends, what we are before without Jesus Christ and what we are now with Jesus. And what we are now are so much better than what we were before. And that is because of the love and grace and mercy of God towards each and every one of us. And how wonderful is that? Amen. Amen. Now, let us together, you know, tell this world what a great God we are all serving. Let us all together tell this world about His mercy, about His love, and about his grace. Now, brethren and friends, the fruits of our discipleship are the fruits of our lips and the fruits of our actions, our whole being given to Jesus Christ. Now, the Great Commission is not the Great Suggestion. I will repeat. The Great Commission is not the Great suggestion as if Jesus was suggesting to us if you have just time if you can just squeeze in into your busy schedule if you are not tired or if you are not sleepy no Jesus was not suggesting to us he was commanding us to disciple our witnessing is to proclaim the truth about Jesus as we have seen through the eyes of our hearts as we go and wherever we go. To proclaim His excellencies as we experience Him in our lives as we go and wherever we go. Now, each one of us, we play an important role in the great purpose of God in revealing Himself to the world. We all have this wonderful opportunity to bring Christ to somebody else. And finally, let me leave you with these words from Psalm chapter 71, verses 15, 16, and 17. I will tell all of your goodness all day long. I will speak of your salvation, though it is more than I can understand. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will proclaim your goodness, yours alone. You have taught me ever since I was young, and I still tell of your wonderful acts. Brethren and friends, the gospel is yours. The fruit of our discipleship is the fruit of our witnessing for Christ. We must go out there, disciple, Bring the gospel to everybody so that they too can have that hope of eternal life that you have in you 
right this very moment. For those who have not yet accepted the Lord, we are calling upon you to come now, repent of your sins, be baptized into Christ, and declare your loyalty and with all humility submit to Jesus Christ. Again, the gospel is yours. Good morning to everybody. Shall we now all stand as we sing the song of invitation? <laughs>